and extract the signal and the noise. I'm John Furrier, the founder of Silicon Edge. I'm my co-host, Dave Vellante, co-founder of Wikibon.com. Our next guest is Ramesh Prabhagaran, VP of Products and Partnerships at Viptela. Welcome to theCUBE. Thank you, glad to be here. So welcome back, I was just, we were talking before we came on, Cisco and Apple announcing a partnership to make the fast lane. Again, wide area networks, carriers, seeing a lot of stuff with Google doing fiber. There's a lot of stuff going on in transport, <laughs> transit, whatever you want to call it. Wide area network, big part of the, of the connected enterprises. That's right. What's going on with the WAN? I mean, SDN, obviously we know what's going on there. How does that translate to inter-office, inter-network? Am I constantly crossing carriers? Is there a one carrier fits all? I mean, what's, what's going on when? Why is it broken? Absolutely, so if you look at it from an enterprise standpoint, typically the predominant mode of connectivity has been you connect all your sites over one or two private networks, add a public network to the mix, and then you call it done, right? That's how traditionally it has been. Now, if you look at it from the standpoint of a CIO that really cares about bandwidth growing 30% year, year over year and trying to keep the cost flat, they have an interesting challenge to, to deal with, right? So if you, if you really look at it, and, and nothing actually encaps the pro, encapsulates the problem like what one of our CIOs mentioned to us, right? He said, why is it that I'm able to do two video streams, high def at my home, have my wife talk on FaceTime, and also have my kids play Xbox Live over a $50 circuit when I can't do any one of those things over a $500 circuit in my office, right? So, and, yeah. and if you really look at it, the- Consumerization. Exactly, right? And, and if you really look at it, the applications are moving to different locations. It's no longer the case that your applications are exclusively inside the data center. Your content could be over the internet. It could be over a public cloud. So a lot of the transformation right now is around how how do you optimize the network connectivity in order to access these services, right? So that's just one piece of it, it's, it's the cost angle. The second big piece of it is really around time to capability, right? And, and in the data center virtualization world, it's all about agility. In the wide area networking world, you're not really talking about milliseconds, you're really talking about minutes to capability, right? And there, you're, you're looking at how do I move from deploying, let's say, two sites a month to maybe 20, 30 sites a month, for example, right? Or 20, 30 sites a day. Mm -hmm. And so that's the kind of agility you're looking for. How do I enforce policies? How do I upgrade my infrastructure? How do I implement change control over my network extremely quickly? So it's a, it's a combination of cost, time to capability, and then of course everybody cares about application performance, right? That resides on top of it, right? Now I need visibility into the applications that's going through my network. Is, is this traffic going to Dropbox versus Office 365 versus SFDC? Yeah. And is this traffic going to cat videos on YouTube, right? I know how, do yeah. I, how do I identify that and yeah. make sure that Although I make cat videos are very popular. <laughs> and drive a lot of traffic and costs. <laughs> exactly. Well, this brings up the question. You brought up the home thing. It's a great example. People can relate to that. Yes. I got a great dynamic network at home, gaming, Netflix, enterprise. It seems to be static and like broken. Is that because the suppliers haven't innovated? Is that because their cost structures and what they pay for, or both? Is it technology or both? I, I think it's a combination of things, right? It's a combination of the amount of innovation that has traditionally been available for the wide area, and also the the, the mirror side of it is also the availability of transport circuits, right? So if you look at the mentality from an enterprise standpoint, it's always been, I build a five nines available network, and I say that's the next big thing, right? And it's always great that way. Now if you look at the cost associated with maintaining and managing a five nines available network, it's extremely, extremely high. And so what customers are gravitating towards is, I have a portion of my network that gives me five nines of availability, I have a portion that gives me maybe just two nines of availability, and, and one that just gives me a lot of bandwidth, and I don't really care about SLA there. Now, me as the enterprise can choose which traffic can go on what type of applications. So at the, at the root of it, what I'm looking for is the ability to use multiple different transport circuits. I need to secure the infrastructure and I need to, able to, I need to be able to also steer the applications in but a certain way. It's just saying, historically, it's been a one size fits all. That's right, exactly. Okay, and so by definition then, I'm either under-provisioned or over for provisioned. That's right, that right? So, exactly. Okay, so how do you solve that problem? So uh, first thing is around the flexibility in using many different types of transport circuits, right? So if I have an MPLS circuit, I should be able to use that. And, and uh, if you want to double your MPLS bandwidth, let's say every three years, it's not going to be economical for you. Now I start to look at, okay, what's really flowing inside my MPLS pipe? Maybe I have some mission critical traffic that I want to keep over it. Maybe I have some other types of traffic that can go over a lesser, lesser SLA path, maybe over a broadband path, right? Now I start 
start to mix and match different transport networks together. And that's what really gives you the economics, right? So I, it's, it's almost a cap and grow in, in one type of the circuit infrastructure and then I have exponential growth in the other one. So that's obviously software in your secret sauce. Absolutely, exactly. And that's where real software innovation comes into the picture, right? Because I drop a device at the remote location and then I figure out, okay, how, what are all the cap components I need? I need on one side, I need to be able to talk to the existing devices. Uh, and so that, there you bring in traditional protocols and whatnot that talk to it. And then on the other side, I need to be able to provide value-added services. Right? And the value-added services always comes in the form of software innovation. Right? And so that's why you choose a Blaze platform, you provide all of the software capabilities, and then that gives you all the value associated. So your with vision it. when you go and talk to a CIO is more than just consumer level experience. It's consumer level experience with all this granularity, with the security, with the resiliency, with the five nights. Talk more about that vision. Uh, absolutely. So the, the vision is my network needs to behave the way I want, right? I mean, at, at the root of it. What, what that means is, if cost is a, if it's a factor, I need cost to be a factor and I need to be able to build based off that. If security is a consideration, and absolutely every single enterprise CIO on the planet now cares about security, I, I need to be able to extend my security perimeter as well to wherever my network is, right? Why is it that I need to artificially place bounds within four walls and contain traffic that way and provide the security. Why can't I extend my security perimeter to wherever it is, right? And then around application intelligence, application visibility, how do I steer certain things in a certain direction? All of those things really come into the picture. And at the same time, if there were supposed to be, a, let's say if there's a problem in the network, the first thing I want is I want to turn off all of those things, I just want basic connectivity, right? So a robust underlying secure infrastructure is table stakes. And so that's why we actually innovated a lot in our technology to provide that robust underlying secure infrastructure first and then build all the value added services on So it's not a, it. not a bolt on, it always says that you know, if you have bolt on security, you're going to have, you're going to have problems. So, but what does that, unpack that for us? What does that mean to fundamentally build security into your architecture? Yeah, I, I may get a little technical here, but yeah, like, let me keep it, it at yeah. a high level, right? <laughs> so today when two devices have to talk to each other, what do you need to do? You need to basically make sure they can talk to each other and then you build all the security policies around it and then you build all the other policies around it and so forth, right? Typically, the network team takes care of the network and activity, the security team builds the security policies at all, and the other guys come and put the policies. Now we have three different teams talk that not, don't talk to each other that often, that want to implement something that flows very well, right? So that's why we said, the first thing we have to do is actually fundamentally integrate routing security and segmentation and policy together, so that if you make changes to one or if you implement one, then it flows through exactly the, the same way. And to give you a, a, a compelling reason as to why this is important, when we go talk to the networking guys, we tell them security builds, is built in standard and so you don't have to worry about it. When we go and talk to the security teams, we say, you have been trying to influence your networking guys to build something, and this way you actually get it, and you just define your policies, and it automatically gets implemented, right? So the conversation now starts to become a lot more interesting for both the parties involved here. So how does what you do tie into this notion of virtualizing the, the data center? Absolutely, so <clears throat> if you look at the virtualization, uh, there are li literally three pillars, right? One is what happens inside the data center, the second piece of it is what happens in the wide area, which is the part that we address. And the third piece is all of the layer four through seven services are getting virtualized as well, right? So now there are two interesting uh, challenges here. One is how do I provide enterprise connectivity so that all the sites can talk to each other over a virtualized WAN, and a virtualized WAN should have all the properties that we just spoke about. Mm -hmm. And how do I access a service as well at a remote point in the most effective way? I'll give you an example, a real example that we heard from one of our large uh, financial customers. They said they have high risk regions and these are regions where they have a lot of political instability and they wanted to implement a policy to take all the traffic coming from those sites, send that through a scrubbing location before it's allowed access into any of their crown assets and data center locations. They wanted to implement this change and they looked up what it takes. They said it'll take about three months to do it and the war broke out yesterday, right? And so <laughs> they're looking for ways to implement these type of things. So in our technology, what we can do is actually you can connect any firewall, for example, connect that into our device and we would advertise the fact that there is a device available at that location that provides these capabilities so that I can put a business policy that says any traffic from this high risk region has to always go through a firewall before it goes anywhere else. Those types of things really took forever with the previous technologies and we've actually brought that into our technology and delivered and we can deliver that in a matter of seconds actually. Okay, so on, uh, pretend I'm a CIO for a minute. I'm like, yes. you know, I have all the troubles you mentioned. I saw your website, you're, you're revolutionizing WAN. What does that mean? I mean, software-defined WAN, obviously software-based, I get that. At least I know SDN, all my guys. What does that mean? Give me the, bo the bottom line. So the bottom line is um, WAN is 10% to 12% of IT today. 
and we can actually bring that down 40% to 60%. Talk right? about the spend. Yeah, the spend, right? Now, if and you, performance if you, maintains. And performance is maintained, you get a 10x improvement in bandwidth, you get a lot better user experience for your cloud applications, and you get a lot better security stance as well, right? So it, if, you, if I have to boil this down to numbers, it's 10% uh, it's to 12% down to 4% of uh, IT for your wide area, uh, and then the, the rest of it is around the security and, and the application so it's like performance. A no yeah, absolutely. So you and guys that's why have good success then on sales conversions. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So we actually <laughs> we have uh, a lot of Fortune 100, Fortune 500 production deployments right now. Uh, in fact, one of our, our largest customers is actually rolling out a network that's about a thousand plus sites, and this is something that they've actually entirely pledged over to the to the WebTela technology because they saw the value that we bring to the table, all the way from bringing up a site to implementing policies to reducing the cost, right? And we're we're able to deliver on the promise that I just spoke right, about to that customer. Give me a specific customer. example and take me through what. What does it take? I'm a, I'm a thousand sites, I got a WAN, I got the cost, my bandwidth's going up, people more accessing apps, everything's going on, that's a, that's okay. normal stuff. Absolutely. How fast am I up and running? Week, month, day? So Take we, me through the life cycle. Yeah, so, um, so what, what's the trigger point, right? The trigger point is I, I, I hit a pain with respect to bandwidth growth or, or my site growth and I'm not able to expand as quickly, right? So when you hit that type of a problem, you're usually willing to look at a new technology, spend, spend, spend some money in it as well, right? And so when we go in and we talk about the value, we can actually deliver the value that we're talking about instantaneously to two sites, right? And, and maybe you have 1,000 sites. Maybe you want to trial the technology across just a pair of sites, right? And that's exactly what we have done with some of the large uh, enterprises. We said, we believe so much that this technology will work that you can actually trial this across maybe two, five sites, whatever it is. Is it a box or is it software? So it's actually both. Okay. Um, so the solution components is there is a box sitting at the uh, location. It could be a branch, a data center, a head end, whatnot. And there's also uh, software components that sit in the cloud. Uh, interestingly, our go-to-market has been either we can provide that as a hosted service for our customers, uh, and the customer is responsible for managing that infrastructure, or through our carrier partners, we can actually offer that as a managed service as well. Uh, interestingly, uh, two of the large tier one carriers have actually taken our technology and have started to provide a managed service out of it in a matter of six months, and that's really record So will they point pace. their traffic at the managed service and then goes through their boxes? Yeah, so the, the carrier in that case would go to the customer and say, okay, I, I can give you uh, MPLS and broadband and 4G LTE and all of the, tra the diversity that you're looking for. I can also manage that infrastructure for you. And for you, it looks like what it was before. I have a circuit going in and I don't need to worry so about anything else. So is problem I've seen? I mean, I've seen it before. The diversity issue, the cost, I built silos. Yep. And then, okay, to bolt on another Exactly. Silo costs more money, so it's kind of like a sprawl exactly. of connections. Exactly, exactly. And, and especially it gets all the more tricky when you're talking about things like mergers and acquisitions, where one company yeah. buys another company, so yeah. I have my own network, I, I subsume something else, yeah. and the larger and the, the enterprise. And the people hold a cling to their network. <laughs> exactly. Because they don't want to get fired. And we have seen some really, really, really broken networks out there. <laughs> right. Can you talk about your product portfolio? You got, you got an SDN controller, you got software, I mean, just lay it out for us. Absolutely, so there are two pieces to the overall solution. One is the device that would sit at the location uh, of the customer. Uh, think of it as a, as a physical device that uh, can go from 10 gigs to 1 gig to 100 meg of encrypted capacity. Uh, and there, really, we're talking about innovation on top of software. So hardware is hardware, but real innovation is on, on, on software. And then all of the, the intelligence when it comes to network-wide policies, network-wide information exchange and whatnot, is actually implemented in a combination of the controller and also the management platform. So we give you all also a single pane of glass that you can use to operationalize this whole network as well. So that point of control is, is the appliance or it's actually the, the it's, a, it's a software, it's yeah. a software. Okay. Uh, and, and again, our go-to-market can be uh, either we host that control uh, cloud component for you or if you're a managed service partner, you can actually host this for your customer as well. And how about the company? You know, give us, where are you at with, you know, Funding, headcount, growth. Sure. So, so the, the public, of, the publicly available information. We closed uh, Series A and Series B, 33 and a half million with a single investor. That's Sequoia Capital. Um, I'm sure many of you have heard Which of it. Which partner is on the board? Uh, so, Mike Gogan is the partner on the board, okay. uh, and is available Great. on the website as well for for anyone to see. Um, and uh, uh, ever since we have actually delivered our solution, we have also been able to deploy this across multiple customers. So, uh, we actually have production deployments, which means paying customers, which certainly helps a startup, as you can imagine. <laughs> Uh, and so we are organically growing based on uh, based on the, the footprint there. Uh, overall, we're uh, um, I would say approximately about 80 people uh, right now as, as a company, and so um, a good mix of uh, engineering and, and go to market. How about and international 
off offices, other areas? Yeah, so we do have uh, two other international uh, locations, one in uh, Asia uh, and also one in, uh, in, the, in the Middle East, uh, and mainly for support and, and sales as we start to expand into those markets as well. Uh, we do have customers outside the US. Uh, we have a, a, a few customers in, in Asia, uh, some in uh, Europe as well that we have deployed. So you mentioned some of the use cases of where you guys are winning. Obviously, mergers and M&A, mergers and acquisitions seems to be a good one. What other areas, if people who are watching out there, um, out there right now saying, I have that problem. What are those things? What were the things that would tell the customer, potential customers, that they should be calling you guys up immediately? Sure, the, the trigger point is usually around some kind of a video application I need to roll to, a, to a, a remote site, right? Because at that time is when my two meg skinny pipes really, really start to hurt, right? Yeah. Uh, and another trigger point is really how do I onboard cloud-based applications? So we have had a disproportionate number of conversations in the recent past around onboarding things like Office 365 and Azure as well. As I start to subscribe to these IAS platforms and SaaS platforms, I need to architect my wide area for, for those. So really the trigger points are around capacity, around Versus cloud what's experience. what's your alternative to that? Just in a public internet backbone? Yeah, you, you can subscribe to a public internet backbone, but then there's no SLA, right? I mean, yeah. I, I, I don't get the user experience, yeah. I get the spinning and wheel, and yeah, if nobody's spotty, happy. it's great at one point, and like, exactly. it's kind of like our office with Comcast. <laughs> exactly. For the small companies. That's but right. You see a lot. So what size profile customers? Small, medium-sized business, or is it large enterprises right now? So interestingly, the solution that we have built actually scales to a really large number, and this is multiple thousands, if not tens of thousands of locations. And as a result, where we have seen our initial penetration is in the really, really Uber large enterprise, uh, and we have also seen. Because that's where the cost numbers are. You and that's exactly first. right. I and mean, if, if you talk to somebody that has like a hundred million van budget, and I say I can slash that down by fifty, it starts to make yeah, absolute yeah, sense. Yeah. You got my You're attention. On a plane. Yeah, like, exactly. Yeah, I saw you do that as well. You took your glasses <laughs> off and you started. Yeah, to look. see you tomorrow. Exactly. Right? Come on, I have, a, I have an opening. Ironically, yeah, exactly. First thing in the morning. And so that's where the problem is very acute. Yeah. And so we are actually seeing customers move very, very quickly as well yeah. uh, there. Right? And, and being an early uh, young company, that's your low hanging. Fruit. Exactly. But your right. managed service could be good for the SMB, for exactly. the enterprise, uh, for the carrier. Exactly. Right? And that's where we really, there's a class of customers where we want to go and have those discussions because they have problems that are really, really complex and you need to be able to have a conversation with them to solve that problem. Uh, there are also a class of customers that can actually just benefit from this technology and, and roll that across 100 sites, 200 sites, 500 sites, whatever it is, right? So where we have built our technology so that it can scale from the really small to the really large and so we are using our, our partners to establish that. Right? Ramesh, I want to ask you, so this is our sixth year doing VMworld. Right. So we've seen a total transformation. What do you make of uh, VMware's moves into networking? Obviously the NICERA acquisition you know, catalyzed all that. Right. As a networking you know, expert, professional, what do, you, what do you make of those moves? Uh, absolutely, so I, I think even if you talk inside the data center, there's a large network component. And so it doesn't make sense to just do server virtualization or storage virtualization and call it done. You need to provide all of the agility with respect to network virtualization. Now, the boundary for that is inside the data center. You need to be able to extend those concepts into the wide area, and you need to extend that as well into your whole NFV type L4 through L7 service virtualization as well. And so I, I'm interestingly seeing that the data center guys are really ahead in providing a solution that's virtualized for the data center. Uh, the wide area, uh, set of vendors, us included, are actually pu pushing our solution for the wide area. And the third piece uh, that completes the puzzle, in my opinion, is really the, the service NFV type virtualization yeah. as well. Well, you, so guys have a, a, you have a great business model. Certainly when you lead in, I'm going to reduce your cost by 60%, that's a big deal. Uh, I got to ask you an industry-wide question since you're here. Um, Cisco, Juniper, these guys have had huge market shares. We've seen the early days of routing, obviously, you know, the Bay, Bay the Wellfleet, the Bay, and those mergers. It's hard to unseat an incumbent like a Cisco. They're so nested in there. Uh, Juniper as well, but they've had a little bit of their trials and tribulations lately. Um, what do these guys struggling with right now? And why are you disrupting them? And what do you have it as an edge over them? And are you afraid of those guys? Yeah, so uh, let me take that in the same sequence, right? So first, what we have built is not a router. <clears throat> if, if I know and position my router versus another router, I'm just comparing capabilities, I'm not changing the conversation at all. So that's why we fundamentally change the conversation by saying, okay, here's a solution, and here are all the values that you will get out of the solution, and a router happens to be a component in that, right? And, but that's not the near all, end all type uh, um, solution where I'm, I'm going and just comparing yeah. apples to apples, right? And so when you change the conversation of that type, you're not playing by the rules that have already been set, 
aside. You're playing by the rules of something that's brand new, right? And so that's where we are seeing the most success. And and there is a certain there is a certain way to approach this market, and we have done this in our previous lives at uh, at Juniper and and all the other places where we've been able to go and displace the the pretty large vendors as well. Uh, as well. Uh, ultimately, at the end of the day, if you provide enough value back to the customer, then technology it's is, a is focus no longer. issue, right? I mean, you got Sequoia exactly. on the on the board; those guys focus. Yes. But, but they also invested in a very successful company called NetScreen. Yes. NetScreen picked a space that was disruptable. Yep. Firewall. Yes. A hard place to compete, Checkpoint, those yep. guys, but they did it really, really well. Exactly. Is that something that you guys see as similar strategy, not uh, firewalls, but like picking a specific spot and nailing that? Absolutely, so the technology that we have built actually has lots of applicability. We have chosen the wide area as the place to, to go and, and, for, and have a foray because that's the place where you see the value show up the fastest, right? And, and we're talking about showing savings within the calendar year of deployment, right? And so that to, to anybody, no it's a no-brainer, right? Yeah, and so, fast break even, absolutely, so. and yeah. as a startup, we have to be focused, uh, and so we have picked the wide area as the, as the first uh, point to, uh, to start the, to disrupt. Yeah. Uh, and then, interestingly, our customers have pulled it into many use cases, and going back to your question, John, on what are the use cases, we started off actually a first uh, Series A, Series B deck, if you look at it as like six use cases. Now we have over a dozen use cases, because customers have said, hey, can I use it here, can I use it here, and we start to expand on so those conversations. So versatility in product. Exactly, right? So it's not yeah. a it's not a single product for a single point solution. It actually has a lot right, more so applicability you're the product as well. Guy. What's next on the product roadmap? So What's the next territory after WAN? Um, revolutionizing the WAN and and software defined. Yeah. So I mean, it, it, yeah. so cloud is another big area, right? And so we are looking at uh, how how you can start to expand your services into into the cloud and start. And that's a natural extension of what we do. Uh, there are a few other areas that our customers have provided input into as well. Uh, as with all things, one thing I've learned in a, in a startup is focus and make sure that the customer on the other end, even before I ask our engineers to write a single line of code, right? And so we are doing that due diligence to make sure that yes, we have identified three different areas, but I want to make sure where I invest, where I can immediately get returns as well. So we're doing do, going through that process as well. All right, well, uh, quick question for you. Are you enjoying the show here? Absolutely, it's a, a, I, I've been a big fan of this show. Uh, and uh, our technical marketing person, David, mentioned that you guys are going to be here at VMworld, and I said I, I absolutely want to awesome. come right. and well, Thanks talk. for coming so, on theCUBE yeah, and sharing the insight, and good luck with your venture. No brainer, knocking down costs at 60 Great way to enter the market with instant value. Uh, we'll be back more with more value here on theCUBE, more insights, sharing the data with you. I'm John Furrier, Dave Vellante. We'll be right back after the short break. You're watching theCUBE live in San Francisco. We'll be right back. <laughs>